Thank you, Alinda. What a nice way to calm our hearts as we uh, come before the Lord. It's Philippians chapter 3. If you have a Bible or you have a, your cell phone, you're going to want to bring that up today. Philippians 3. We come in here very often. We come in here and we listen to God's Word and we sing and we find ourselves maybe later in the week not feeling like any of this any longer. I think we come in and we get our minds and our hearts settled with hearing God's Word, being with God's people, and we're like, yeah, that's, that's where I belong. That's what feels good. One moment, and then we find ourselves maybe in a different manner later on. Today's goal is not to tell us to try harder, to work harder at following after God, but rather it's that we pray to God for the desire for us to pursue God, follow God consistently throughout our weeks. I think I'm like you where there are days I'd rather enjoy binging a TV show than prayer, Bible study, or some other Christian discipline or thought. And then I wonder, is that me? Is that who I really am? One that has the Bible off to the side, and yet it's another show, and I'm just, I'd prefer that? Or is it me that when I do open, and as I spend time in the Word, I want more of it? And I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. And we do a Sunday morning, and we're like, yeah, that feels right. I just feel more at home there, and I wonder which one is me. How can this exist both this way? There was a character in, um, that I believe was born in 1906. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was executed in Flossenburg, Germany in 1944. Just weeks before his execution, which was April 9th, 1944, right before, weeks before, this poem made its way out of Flossenburg uh, concentration camp. And listen to these words of his. The title is, Who Am I? He said, Who am I? They often tell me that I step from my cell's confinement calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire from his country house. Who am I? They often tell me that I used to speak to my warders freely and friendly and clearly as though they were mine to command. Who am I? They also tell me that I bore the days of misfortune uh, equibly, smilingly, proudly, as if I'm accustomed to win. Am I then really what everyone says of me, or am I only what I myself know, restless, longing, and sick, like a bird in a cage, struggling for breath as though hands were compressing my throat, yearning for colors, for flowers, for voices of birds? thirsting for words of kindness, for neighborliness, tossing in expectations, powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, weary, empty, and praying and thinking, or making faint, and ready to say farewell to it all. Which one am I? Who am I? And I think this duplicitous spirit is honest for us to say, yeah, I have it too. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life, and it, quite honestly, in those moments where it's just godless, it's not wrong necessarily, it could be wrong too, but it's just godless, it's without Him. I'd rather get up and just do my thing, my time, my way. But then those days in which you wake and you spend time in the Word and you're like, this is what I'm created to do and be, and it feels so right, it's so good, then it begs the question, who am I? Which one is this? And afraid to say it, afraid to come right out and admit it, and say, yes, I would rather do this than spend time in God's Word. 
The Apostle Paul was very similar in those famous words in Romans chapter 7 when he said, For I don't understand my own actions. I don't do what I want to do, but they are the very things I hate are the things that I do. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That's Paul talking. So this morning, I'm not saying as a result, hey, let's fight those feelings and stop being that way, but I want to start even a step sooner and say, I want to acknowledge the fact that there are enough times in my life I'm not interested, that I'm asking God to put in me an increasing desire and passion for him and desire and passion to follow after him because I can't fake that. I don't want to just feel guilty and open God's word because I know I should out of this pure obligation and just keep fighting for it more and more, but rather ask God for it. That's what we're asking today. It's a simple ask. It's used in a couple verses in the Bible as a prayer for ourselves, a prayer for people that we love, people maybe who we don't even know. So let's turn this over to the Lord as we begin. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And with our heads bowed, it's a very simple, are you willing to pray for Paul's passion for Christ to become your passion? Dear Heavenly Father, we have many distractors in our life, misplaced priorities. We're asking that you would put within us an increasing passion and desire to be yours. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So three observations on this text. Take a look at it. If you have it there, I hope you do, that you can just follow along. It's Philippians 3. He starts with a reference back, so we'll have to pause for a moment. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Okay, he's referring back up. Just look at verse 10. His prayer that I may know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I obtain the resurrection from the dead. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Now verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He has quite a statement of humility in verse 12, not that I've already obtained this. Wait a minute, you're the Apostle Paul. There are statues for you. You're the man who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is a wonderful statement of a humility for all of us. Not that we have ever made it. We've not made it. It's not over. We're not there yet. If Paul wasn't, we certainly aren't. But press on to make it your own, like Christ made you his own. Take a look at that again when it says, but I press on, I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made me his own. The press on is used, that same words commonly used in warfare texts. I seize it. It's a company of soldiers seizing something. I press on. I seize this. I seize Jesus Christ. I grab hold of him the way in which he seized me. Oh, there's worth some contemplation. 
First, think of how, how did Christ seize Paul? Do you remember? It was Acts 9. He's going down this dirt road all by himself, and there is this bright light, and there is this voice that says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he's blinded instantly. In fact, blindness that didn't go away. So after that exchange, they had to move him off to a city of Damascus where he'd not really been into a house that he'd not been in for days. He didn't eat, and he was completely blind. That's how Jesus seized him. Okay, so now we read it. Not that I've already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on. I press on to make it my own the same way that he seized me, I'm seizing this. Okay? But our topic today is making it our prayer. I want us to pray to God that we would seize him, that we'd press on to him the same way that he came after you. He came after you, and he did not ask for anything. All he said was, believe me. And he changed you. He's given you the hope, the confidence of eternal life. He gave that the way he seized you, seize him. So day after day goes by, and we live the very way that we intend to live. You know what that means? Last week, for instance, so whatever your week was made up of, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever that week was made up of, the lack of time that you spent seizing Christ, the time you spent seizing Christ, think of your last week. Your last week was exactly what you intended it to be. That's what you wanted. If you're waking every day and your Bible, it's just, it's not really of that much interest to you, and you're living your week as your week, this is your week, and you try to bring Jesus in for portions just to season it, if that's how you've chosen to live your Christian life, that is fully intended by you. That's how you're doing it. For the many of you that are choosing to live your week as completely, totally committed to Christ, living for Him, pursuing Him, and it's seasoned with your week, your appointments and your obligations, but you are sold out for Him. If you're living that way, you're doing it by choice. You're intending to do it. So let's not look back and go, oh, I'm just in a rut. I'm just in it. No, you're not. You have the same amount of time as the person who's living and running a billion-dollar corporation. We have the same amount of time. We're not too busy to follow after God. It's not because we don't know how to follow after God. It's because we've chosen not to. There's a great old parable that was written. It's in the mid, right mid-1800s. And he was known to write parables. And one of them was, he said, uh, he goes, you see two men. One has the habit of regular duties of prayer and devotion. And the other does not. He said, the difference is not that one is trained to do it and the other is not trained to do it. The difference is this one intends to pray and have devotion. This one does not intend to. <laughs> that's the reason. And I think we just look back, and if, that's str if you're struggling with walking and following after God this past week, I think we admit it. We just simply say it. God, and it's not bad. It's just humbly saying, I can't do this. 
I'm not capable of this. I don't want to desire the things that I desire, and I want you to change my desires for you. It becomes a prayer because as we pray it, he puts that desire and change within us. Or just work harder at it. I mean, how many of us have done that? We've just worked harder. God, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read and I'm gonna study your word and I'm not gonna miss church, and we just work harder at it. And the end of the story is the same as the story's always been. The definition of insanity. So we take one step back and we go, God, I'm gonna just be honest with you. There are plenty of days that Netflix is far more appealing to me than you. I'm humiliated to say that, God. I'm embarrassed. But I'm just saying it. I'm confessing it and asking that you put within me the desire, the passion for you. Give me the discipline to pursue you above all else. There's a great sense of humility and a I've not made it spirit. In fact, this is the sentence I typed on this. God, give me the humble resolve. Put in me an undying devotion for you because I'm so sinful, I can't assemble it together on my own. Does that sound like you? I'm admitting it's me. I'll read that brief prayer again. God, give me the humble resolve. Put in me an undying devotion for you because I'm so sinful that I can't gather it up for myself. I need you to do it for me. Look, another observation as his leading up to this strain and pressing on. It's verses 13 and 14. It's your past is past. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own. That's funny. Verse 12 started that same way. Not that I have already obtained this. And now it's, I don't consider that I've made it my own. Like, I'm not there yet. But one thing I do <clears throat> is I forget what lies behind, and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is a great statement and confession. How many of you already have that memorized from years back? Isn't that a common one? This is a great text to memorize. There's a few weird things in the Greek that we don't have, and a lot of times in a footnote they'll tell you, like this says, one thing I do, and we read it and we go, yeah, yeah, I got it. One thing I do. Well, they have a way in which to emphasize it. They can emphasize a word based on what they add within the word. We don't have that. It's, it's genius. I don't want us to add it because I think English is confusing enough, and I'll never master it if it got even more confusing. But there is an emphasis on the word I. That's the, that's the punch when he says... But one thing I do, so you don't get that by reading it. Now, if we heard him read it, that's how he would say it. Well, I'll tell you one thing I do. This is the Joshua kind of moment. Hey, listen, I don't care what you do, but as for me in my house, right, this is that moment. I don't consider that I've made it my own. I am not there yet. But one thing I do this is what I do, forgetting what lies behind, and I strain forward for what lies ahead. I press on for the goal of the prize of that high and heavenly calling of Christ Jesus. Not that I've obtained it. I do not consider what I have, that I've made it my own. There's an authentic humility, and a thought came across this text with me this week sitting there with my coffee and thinking. And I wrote this, and it sounded so right. The authentic humility, this I've not made it idea, 
I wrote, I have further to go than where I have already been. And I stopped and I looked at it. And I would venture to say most of us don't think that. I have further to go in my excelling in my walk with Christ than the distance I have already gone. I think that most adults who know Christ would say, from when I came to know Christ, whenever that was, first realized I need Him and I put my faith and trust in Him only for eternal life, that moment to today, the excelling in my walk with Christ, and here I am, X amount of time left in life, we don't know, that we, we, oh yeah, we don't plateau. I could go up to here maybe. No, you've gone this far. There isn't a limit here. Let's say it this way. I came to know Christ here. I am now here. And I could go here. I think we coast. I got it under control. I've got a routine, and I think I'm okay, and I think I can kind of, it's flat from here on out, and I'll keep growing in my faith, but truthfully, I'm pretty far. I think that's a common thought. But you have Paul who says, I've not even obtained it yet, or I don't consider that I have made it my own. I don't consider that I've made it my own. I have so far to go. I'm going to tell you, Paul was way beyond me, and he said, I have still a long ways to go. I don't want any of us as believers, especially if you've known the Lord for a long time, to think, I'm now kind of, I'll grow a little bit more. No, I want us to realize we can grow a lot more. That humility to say, as a family, as a dad, as you're sitting there, you're in a good routine, but I'll tell you, there are dads that are so further along than us. I want to look at them as examples, and I want to keep going and keep growing and keep excelling along the way with the admission that I have not made it yet. We've not made it. We have so far to go. He brings a little bit of that uh, a race, uh, running a race wording. He says, one thing I do, forget what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't look back. This is true in athletics. This is true in life. Don't keep looking back. The past is past. All those mistakes, they've been made, they're done. Probably more than you know, we've hurt people. It's past. Don't look behind. Look ahead. When we were first married, we lived uh, for, I think, maybe about six months at her folks' house, which actually would have been fine. He's a great guy. I love my mother-in-law. She really is a wonderful lady. The bad news is they live on a farm. So who's the father-in-law's genius? He's not feeding the animals first thing in the morning, not when he's got a new son-in-law in the house. Am I right? There is nothing like that 5 a.m. crunching of the snow under your feet. It's so perfectly quiet out, and it's so cold that the snow is too cold. It just crunches. Well, come spring, I said he's a great guy, and he is. He's very intelligent, but made a mistake. He put me on a 1486 international tractor. Uh, with a cultivator, 12 rows, corn, so cute, little corn was so little, 
and you know you're out there a long time. Those of you that farm, you, this is all familiar to you. You know you're out there a long time when on the radio, of which I had in the cab, the Christian radio station, I'm listening to the same uh, preacher that I listened to early in the morning. I'm now listening to it as it comes around again in the evening. You're just sitting there, row after row. And you glance, and you're like, how far have I been in the middle of this field so long? And I remember we were, I, I saw away at the end his truck, and I thought he was going to bring me a snack, <laughs> which is not true. So I finally get over to him, and I jump out, and, and he's so cool. He says something like, yeah, this year we've got cultivating disease. I went, Really? He goes, yeah, you're just right directly wrong and all the corn's upside down. And I went, oh, yeah, that happened a little bit. He goes, oh, no. He goes, do you, you know when you miss one row, you miss all 12, right? You know that. And so then I would look back, and that's what he knew it. He knew I was doing that. Right? I look back, and as I look back, I would drift. And when you drift one row, there's 12 rows of upside-down corn. And I quick look ahead, get resituated, taking out the weeds in between. That is true in athletics. That is true in driving. It's definitely true on a motorcycle. It's true in farming, and it's true in the Christian life. Keep your eyes ahead. Keep looking on. The past is the past. Just let it go. They hurt you really bad. Yeah, that's fine. Keep your eyes ahead. And you can't just decide, I'm going to ignore the past, and I'm going to, we're not talking about uh, repressing it. It's all there, but we're not dwelling on the past. And it's not that you can just decide, I'm not going to think about the past. You can't just not think about it. You have to fill it with something else, and we press on to the prize, that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We set our mind ahead. See, there's this humility that says, I've not made it. And that's why you are so amazing at welcoming new people in the building, because you do. You may not know this, because, but I do because I have enough new people that are friends of mine that come here that say, it is the most humble, friendly crowd you'll ever want to know. And I'm like, that's it. That's the spirit. It's come on with us. We are no better than you. You are exactly like us. Come as you are. We are as we are. Let's together forget the past and let's look ahead to the prize of knowing Christ. And we have a long ways to go. We have a long ways to go. To the day I die, I want to say that. God, give me another couple days because I have some progress I need to make. Keep going, keep going, keep the eyes ahead, keep pressing on. It's a wonderful classic passage. This is Paul said to his little buddy Titus in the book of Titus, for we ourselves, we were foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to passions, passing our days with malice and envy, hated by others, hating people, but it was the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior when it, He appeared, He saved us. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of His grace, He saved us. You agree with that? That's it. Don't strive harder. Or fix your day. Ask God to put it in us. And we all together look ahead. Look at each other. Are you further along than me? Yeah, you may be. But it's a long, long ways to go. We keep pressing on, and we help each other grow, and we keep progressing and moving. Uh, Grant, when he was small, loved soccer. He was, they called him the wall. He you know, went little soccer, just about the age where they all move around with the ball, right? They don't know the position is soccer, and so they all move. Grant was smart enough to not move around with the ball because he thought that's a lot of moving, so he would just stay up ahead of the uh, goalkeeper and just stand there. 
And he, can't be, he couldn't be faked out. Just a little guy. He's just staring at the ball. So the guy's doing that stuff, and he's like, yeah, whatever, I'm watching. And then he was the wall because they could never get past him. But when he ran, it was hilarious. It's the funniest thing. And we're screaming, go! And it's like Charlie Brown. It, he was a lot like Charlie Brown. And he starts running, and like the movement of the arms, and he's just, you can almost walk past him. And a coach used to always yell out to him, and we loved it every time. The coach would yell out to Grant, unhook the trailer. Unhook the trailer. And then he'd fight more and do his best, and I'm just laughing. Unhook the trailer. He still thinks that's funny today. Your past is your past. Just unhook the trailer. We came to know Christ, and when we did, everything's new. We don't look back. Regrets, of course. Make them right when it's time to make them right. But we don't dwell on it. You've hurt people. People have hurt you. Don't hold them to a standard that you're not being willing to be held to yourself. For everyone that hurt you, you've got somebody too. Well, the Lord sort all that out, and we just keep our eyes ahead at our loving Savior, and it's personal. It's personal. He's got you in your pace that you move and you progress and you strain forward and the past comes up. We go, no, unhook the trailer. Unhook the trailer. I'm not letting that hold me back. I'm going. I'm moving. I'm progressing. This last one is just kind of a wrap-up verse, verse 15 and 16. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, and if anything else you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Let us hold true what we've attained. He has humility all the way through this thing. We've not arrived. Give no impression Let's none of us give any impression that we've made it. Forget what's behind. Press on to what's ahead. To know Christ. So you have a day ahead of you. I don't know what your day looks like today. Lunch, maybe, hopefully. Then some fun. You're going to have some fun maybe today. Nap. How many of you guys are going to pull off a nap today? Let me see. Okay, how many of you, I just, now I'm just curious. Now this is like squirrel. I'm just curious, how many of you do a nap, but you act like you really didn't because you're just in the chair, you doze off, you say, I didn't really nap. Seriously? Good for you. We have a new generation of that. I wasn't sleeping. No, you were drooling, and you, there, it was so sleepy. No, it wasn't. I was just sitting here. So we slip into our secular life, whatever. You know, secular just means without God. So we're just doing things, and we're busy in the garage, and we're doing projects. But this verse, that's a great passage to press on, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward, press towards the goal, the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, you dig, dig a little deeper into Bonhoeffer, uh, there's some pretty spectacular… Um, he gave a devotional, actually, as he was being led to, uh, to be hanged, and uh, SS Guard was in tears, hated the thought that he was going to the gallows. He literally had his hands on shoulders saying, it's okay. Flossenburg concentration camp was liberated uh, two weeks later. Heinrich Himmler himself said, kill Bonhoeffer. Twenty days later, Himmler took his own life. They were just cleaning the place out, cleaning the place out, but get Bonhoeffer for sure. I didn't read the last stanza, so here it is. Who am I? Am I this or am I the other? 
am I this pagan? I don't want to pray. I don't want to do things. I just, I'm afraid, right? The compressing of the throat. I'm longing for companionship. Which am I? Am I one person today and then tomorrow another? Or am I both at once a hypocrite before others, before myself, a contemptible, woebegone weakling? Or is something within me still like that beaten army fleeing in disorder from victory already achieved? Here it is, the last line. Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, that I'm yours. His last poem he wrote. I don't know. You may, you may be disappointed to hear that I prefer Netflix over Bible reading. I don't know how any of this strikes you. But this thought, this duplicitous spirit within us, I see in many of the great women and the great men of the faith, when they're just broken down and honestly writing, I'm seeing the same thing. In church leaders... Westminster Abbey in London has 12 massive modern martyrs carved in stone above the side of Westminster Abbey. One of them is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's a giant. He's a giant who inside admits, I am not able to do this. I am so disappointed in myself so often that I don't even know which one is me. I love that honesty. I don't know which one is me. I want to grow in my faith, and I want to please my parents or grandparents or friends that are walking with the Lord, but then the other moment, I don't. Which is it? And I love settling in the middle in those final words of his. Who am I? Yeah, they mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, God, you know, because I'm yours. That I know. And what we're asking today is that we take, and in the notes, it's at the bottom of your notes, in your insert, you take that verse and you make it a prayer. Turn it into a prayer for yourself and turn it into a prayer for those that are around you. And we can even do it right now. So let's bow together. Let's bow together. Think of someone. Could be yourself. You pray like this, but God, one thing I do, I want to forget what lies behind and I want to strain forward to what lies ahead. I want to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's our prayer. Our heads still bowed. Think of the President of the United States more than anything else. I pray, Heavenly Father, that our President, the one thing that he does, that he'd forget what lies behind and he strains forward to what lies ahead, that he presses on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of you, Heavenly Father, in Christ Jesus. Whatever that takes, fulfill that in his life your boss, your kids, your grandkids. Heavenly Father, we're bowing right now to you, and we're asking the one thing, if we would do it, that we would forget what lies behind and that we would strain forward to what lies ahead, that we would press on towards that goal for the prize of that upward, high, heavenly calling that you have, that calling on us in Christ Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen.